This all stand turn to number 46, you know, in song number 46. Let's all turn to number 39 in the song. Number 30. Ken's going to come now, and when he gets done feeding you spiritually, we got some good food in the fellowship building. We'll all feed our place a little bit. Okay. That's an encouragement for me to get done uh, quickly. Yeah. I heard that. So. <laughs> well, it's good to be here again. I think I was here last year. Yeah, I was here. Okay. I, that could be a good thing or bad thing, but I was here. Yeah, I'm good. Always enjoy the fellowship up here, the smiling faces. And uh, before I open in prayer, I'd like to turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. But we'll start there. The 
Yes, I'd better get that too. Now I've got a booster over here. That's my booster. <laughs> yes, sir. Veterans Day. I wanted to remind everybody of that. Thank you very much. Remember the veterans? I'm one of them that served our country. And uh, Thank you. great opportunity. You need to spend a week on the submarine to really enjoy the air that you breathe outside. Trust me. But Veterans Day is very, very critical because a lot of people gave their blood for the liberty, the limited liberty we have right now. Went away very quickly, as people well noticed. But uh, Colossians chapter 3, let's open the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you purposed in your creation. And you purposed it to be centered around your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died the death that we should have died. And he became sin for us at Calvary that you might make us the righteousness of God in him by faith alone with no merit on our part. We thank you, Lord, for doing that. And that we get to participate in the age of come to see what you're planning to do with a restored universe under your authority and the Lord Jesus Christ at the center. And looking forward to that opportunity as Paul was looking forward to it in Philippians chapter 1, because he'd already seen glory. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the freedom we have today. Thank you for the veterans, and we thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. Amen. Okay, Colossians chapter 3. Now, we've got some folks from our assembly down in South Carolina. If you're ever near easily on Sunday, come visit. We can give you an address. I think I've got it memorized. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Colossians chapter 3, I want to start reading. We were given kind of an assignment, and, but we have liberty to go beyond what we were given. I want to start in chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ. That sounds like a conditional statement, doesn't it? Have you been risen with Christ? That's a question. Yes. If you trusted him and his death at Calvary, I'm going to use the board as it's already drawn up here. I'm going to do a few other things. But if you then be risen with Christ, see those things which are what? Above. Above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on what? So if you look around, I don't watch the news anymore. Okay? Because there's nothing good on. All I do is see sin and decay everywhere I look. So I'd rather look in here and think of being with my Savior. Because you never know when that's going to happen. <clears throat> yeah. We might be drawing our last breath right now. You don't know. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are what? Dead. And your what? Life is hid with Christ where? That's in God's talk. That's two layers of protection. <laughs> we have security in that position. And we are just as certain of glorification. When you read Romans chapter 8, God already sees us glorified. Why well, look glorified to you today? <laughs> I'm still walking around in a body that has these members that I got from genetically my dad. So, as we continue down, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him. Where? Glory. Yeah, glory. That's up here, he had us meeting him in the air. Those that are dead physically get resurrected first. And then we that are alive and remain, if it happens right now, that would be us, are going to be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. 
And we're all going to go up together. Nobody's getting ahead by head of the line. They're just going to get resurrected before we get changed if we're alive. Which end do you want to be on? Resurrected? Changed. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I've had an interesting year with that, that sort of thing. So when you, when you take a look at that, there's a parallel passage. When we looked at this morning in Philipp I mean in Ephesians chapter 1, okay, Ephesians chapter 1, that uh, Brother Perry went through. Starting in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things which are in, in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. All of these first three chapters are giving you God's perspective and his wisdom of his creation and his eternal purpose in his son. He's telling you what he, his wisdom, created. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Who first trusted in Christ? God the Father did. In eternity past, when he brought out the plan, God the Son said, I'll go, I'll do it. And he trusted him to accomplish what he did at Calvary for the purpose and inheritance that God has in the body of Christ and in the nation of Israel here on the earth, ruling and reigning over the nations for all eternity. He trusted him to do that. And what did God the Son do? He absolutely trusted the plan of God the Father because what was, what was the plan of God the Father in the cross? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to go back to Colossians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though, as though God, the Father, did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Now at work, people do this all the time. In my stead, so-and-so is going to be in charge. In Christ's stead, we, the body of Christ, are the only visible evidence that is on planet Earth today. There are no signs, no wonders. It's us. We are the body of Christ. First uh, Timothy 3, 15 and 16, when he talks about that, that's talking about the body. That's what people see today, is us. And they see Christ in us. Or they see us and our nature from our dad. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God the Father did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye individually, and that's, an, and that's plural, ye, all, everybody you come in contact with. We got a fellow here that goes down the Greenville streets and preaches every week. Uh, are you going with them now, Tim? Have you been going with them? I will be, though. Okay. They go downtown, they've already run into legal problems. <laughs> So, uh, for be ye reconciled to God as a son of Adam, for he hath made him, God, uh, the him and the he's, I'm going to tell you how they go in there. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us, that. The reason he did that, he made him sin. Does anybody know what time of the day that was? That he became sin? When did the darkness cover the earth? From noon to three. From the sixth hour, day starts at 6 a.m. 
The sixth hour of the day is noon. The three, he became sin. And why did darkness come? Because God cannot, God the Father cannot look upon sin. He became that for us. Became sin for us who knew no sin. Who knew no sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. Now, there's a lot going on in this world today, a lot more than there was two years ago, three years ago. And I don't want it to get you down. When Paul writes his prison epistles, guess where he's writing from? He's in the lockup. And it's a lot, most of it was not as nice as what you get when you go to the lockup today. Okay? All right? But the Apostle Paul, when he was writing, he was always encouraging them to take the knowledge they had and let it work out through them. Um, example of that, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Actually, I'm going to pick up something out of chapter 11 first. <clears throat> Paul gives his credentials as an apostle in chapter 11. It's an interesting set of credentials. It's all the suffering he's had. What have we been called to do? Suffer, Suffer in his stead. We're here. He's gone. Those that live godly in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.12, shall suffer persecution. Now, you don't go out and cause it. But if you're going to present the word of God rightly divided, how many people have ever hugged your neck for giving it to you? <laughs> yeah, that, same here. Same. Well, I've had a few. I've had a few. Huh? Well, I had a brother one time call up, and he said, I need to ask you a question about tithing. And I had been going to church with him for a while because I'd gone through a, a, a crisis in life. And I said, I said uh, he was going. He asked me about tithing. And he said, I said, do you want me to really answer this for you? He said, yeah. So guess what it did? I showed him grace giving in Paul's epistle, First Corinthians. Okay. Second Corinthians. I'm sorry, chapter eight, nine, ten. Grace giving. It's not tithing. It's not a, st a stipend. It's, it's whatever you have that you're willing to give, you give out of your heart. And he goes to the poorest of the ones he dealt with that were suffering greatly in Philippi, and he uses them as an example. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine Infirmities. You know what infirmities are. Okay? The older you get, the more you know about infirmities. I was going upstairs the other night, on uh, the night before you went to daylight, say, uh, we went to Eastern Standard Time, which I hate, but it gets dark too early. I love it. Uh, yeah. I knew you'd be contrary, Gary. <laughs> but anyway, I was going upstairs and I went, oh, does my wife know the time changes tomorrow? So I turned around to go down, and I went down nine steps on my back. And I didn't. I felt it going down, but I, I feel fine right now. And we'll see what it's like in next week. But infirmities, these are infirmities he suffered because he preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Mm -hmm. That which was kept Satan since the world began, but made manifest to the saints to us today, because it's time. When Saul of Tarsus was going to Damascus to persecute those that were Jesus of Nazareth, you notice what he said? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When he's persecuting them, he's persecuting Christ. When someone's persecuting you, guess who they're persecuting? Christ. That's why he says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll repay. You don't need to. I'll do a better job. <laughs> That's what this is over here. 
Or they can come join us over here on the cross. This over here is the lake of fire. Okay? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the glory of the things which concern my infirmities. And he just goes through a litany of them. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor, now where was he going on that day when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ? He was heading to Damascus. And when he gets to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, guess what he does? He goes into the synagogue and begins to preach what? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the, he's the Messiah, the anointed one. And when he gets done doing that, guess what? They want to kill him. Now that's, that's ultimate persecution. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the, of the Damascenes with a garrison of troops desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Now there's an escape route. He didn't go out the front door, didn't go out the back door, he went out a window down the side of the building to be able to get away. That's how serious the situation was. And that's when he first trusted Christ as the Messiah. It didn't get better as time went on. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He tells them that in the third account in the book of Acts. The abundance of the revelations. I'll get to that in a minute. And a new man, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Why couldn't you tell if he was in or out of the body? People that uh, from our fellowship know the answer to that. Why couldn't he tell? Huh? <laughs> well, he didn't know. I don't know. But I can tell you when Jews stone someone, and he, above 14 years ago, you go back in the book of Acts, that's at Lystra. Guess what happened to Paul there? He got stoned. Ah. And when a Jew stoned somebody, they knew how to check to see if they were dead. So I don't know if he was in the body or out of the body. Either way, such an one was caught up into the third heaven. That's where God's throne is, the third heaven. We live in the atmospheric heaven right here on the earth. And it goes out until you can't, birds can't fly in it anymore. Planes can't fly in it anymore. You can, you can just go so high. Third heaven... And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God, no. It was so real to him, he could look at his hands like the man in Luke 16, the rich man. He could look at Lazarus. He could see Abraham. And he knew who they were without name tags. How do you do that? Right now, we have the corruption and the bondage of this world that hides the the invisible from us. When you leave this body with God the Holy Spirit in the heaven, in the third heaven, like Paul did, guess what? Now you see. Now you hear. But you still look at yourself. You got hands. You got ears to hear with. You can see. You can speak. And Paul talks about that event. I knew a man, such a man, Verse 3, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. He says that twice. Was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory. So Paul just gets stoned. And if you go back and look at the account, Acts chapter 14, guess what? He jumps up. Okay? And goes back into the city of Lystra. And guess what? He preaches again. Whatever he saw, whatever he sensed at that time, was so much so energizing 
and hold him back. He went back in and kill me again. I don't care. Now, am I looking to get killed? No, I got people I care about that still need my help. I like to stay around a little longer. But uh, Paul looked forward to that event. Down through the passage, and the reason I'm here is because we live in a world that's so corrupt and so evil, it's going to get probably worse, not better, before it gets better, better. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, verse 5, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, for now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. He wasn't glorying in himself. He was glorying in his infirmities. And he learned some things. We're going to look at something else here in just a few minutes. And lest I should be lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, there's a lot of different ideas on what that is. I just looked up one word since I've had reason experience with it, and that's buffet. That's to strike about the head or face, usually with a closed fist, but not always. It can be an open hand. Buffeting. You don't see that in the list on the previous page. You see a lot of other things, but you don't see that. Uh, <clears throat> For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said, yes, I'll take it away. That sounds like Benny Hinn, doesn't it? If you go that far back. But, uh, my grace is sufficient for thee. Why would I take it away from you when I can multiply my grace in you beyond measure? Why would you want me to take it away? Listen to his response. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My weakness, my inability to do anything about it. We get to this age. I'm 73. I've had three procedures in the last four years. And I'm going, man, I'm falling apart pretty quick. <laughs> okay? My grace is sufficient for thee. That's singular. He, he point directly the article at Paul. Most gladly, therefore. Oh, I'm sorry. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that. You heard your uh, brother Perry and brother Richard talk about the power. That the power. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of of who? Christ may rest upon me. If it's going to rest on me, guess what he needs it more of? Others. He wasn't a masochist. He saw that in his inability to do, he had to fully trust the Lord Jesus Christ, not for the outer man, but for the inner man. That inner man is what we study and build by faith. That's why we study the verses. Therefore, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. You ever been reproached by a good friend? That's kind of tough. An ally. In necessities. He didn't have food at times or clothing. In persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am what? Then, when I am weak, then am I strong. Sounds like a contradiction in terms. When he's weak, he has no strength within himself. He's totally at the mercy of the, of the Roman army. It's kind of interesting, too. I'm just as a side, Romans 1.16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Roman. Why does it say Greek? Not Roman. Wasn't it the Roman Empire? It's 
says Greek because Paul knew the prophetic program, and from the time the Medo-Persian Empire collapsed to the Grecian Empire, from that time on, those two legs on that image for Nebuchadnezzar go all the way down to the ten-toed kingdom of the Antichrist. It should be Greek. That's what it is in Greek. Oh, you've heard that before. <laughs> all right. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and so on. I am become a fool in glorying because he's glorying in what? Not Paul. He's glory, glorying in what Christ does when he's weak. His power, his strength in Paul becomes manifest. I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commanded of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. He persecuted the church. He said he wasn't fit to be an apostle in 1 Corinthians 15. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. He didn't take penny from it. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> That's kind of a weird response, isn't it? Come over to Philippians with me, please. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. The Philippians is who he writes about in Corinthians concerning giving to remind the uh, uh, the Corinthians that they had promised to send a, an offering to the poor saints of Jerusalem. Why were there poor saints of Jerusalem? Say it again. They sold all they had. They sold all that they had. Okay. Why'd they do that? Preparation of the kingdom. They were commanded. That's the giving program in the book of Luke. Sell what you have and give alms. You know what alms are? You take what you have and you give it to the poor that need it. And they had everything common. They laid at the apostles' feet and they did the distribution. Okay? The dispensation. Theirs stopped when Stephen was stoned. Don't press anymore. Therefore, when it stopped, something else began. The dispensation of the grace of God began where Jew and Gentile doesn't matter whether you're uncircumcised or circumcised. It doesn't matter. Jew or Gentile, we're all the same. I like the drawing already up there. It makes that way it's more legible. Philippians, Philippians chapter. Let's see. What did I say? Chapter two. Three. Yeah, chapter three, verse ten. We'll start. We'll start in chapter three, verse seven. But what things were gained to me, he gives us credentials of being of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the two southern tribes that didn't go in apostasy with the other ten tribes. The tribe of Benjamin. Circumcised the eighth day by the law. It was on the eighth day when it's supposed to be. And he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. For what things were gained to me were those I counted lost for Christ. Say, Dallas, I count all things but lost for, ex for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. What all things did he lose? Every credential he had as a Jew, he lost. All of them. He's no longer a Pharisee. He no longer has that position, that authority. He was rejected, and they tried to kill him numerous times. When they could get hold of him, they put him in prison, put him in stocks. What things were gained to me, those things I count lost for Christ. Hey, Dallas, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Well, he's already got Christ, doesn't he? What's he talking about this winning Christ? Okay? You know there's a 
there's a reward or a prize in the future for body members. You're building it in your inner man right now. You take it with you when you depart that body or you carry your glorified body because you were there for the rapture when it changed. You carry that prize. And it's going to come under the scrutiny in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He's going to evaluate it of what sort. <coughs> chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians also. Okay. Okay. Okay, Dallas, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith, throughout some English after it's a genitive case, it's a possessive, it's Christ's faith. There'd be another way to say it, the faith of Christ. Faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. There is your faith. His faithfulness to trust what God the Father had given for him to do. His faithfulness in that is the only reason you and I can have eternal life. That's it. Verse 10. That. There are certain words in Paul's epistles like but or but now. That is one of them. That. Here's why he did it. Paul. That I may know him. You know what he said earlier? I may know him. That's a progressive knowledge in your inner man where the experiences of life knock you to your knees. I've had that literally too in the last five months. <laughs> experiences of life knock me to my knees. Those things where you can't do anything, you lean on him. And you learn to walk by faith in that expectation of a glory which shall be revealed in us. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. All the way unto death. How did Paul die? Did he die a natural death? No. How did he die? He was put to death by the Roman Empire. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. He knew his execution date in 2 Timothy 4. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not from the dead, he's got that. He wants in this life the resurrection that he talks about in Romans 6, to Romans 12, to be working in his weakness power of Christ. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You know what Christ wanted for Paul? Paul might know him in the details of his life where you suffer in this body and your weakness gets turned into power by him in the inner man. Paul wanted that. He's asking for trouble. Because it's going to come your way every time you preach Christ according to Revelation of the Mystery outside of a gathering like this. And you've experienced it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I know you're getting hungry. I'm, I'm kind of, I'll be done here a little bit. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not the resurrection from the dead. He's got that. But he's talking about that resurrection that he talks about in Romans 6, 1 through 4. That being raised. Well, I'm not literally raised yet. I'm still in this body. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ wanted it for Paul, probably more than Paul wanted it. Paul wanted it a bunch. He knew it would come through his weakness, which means suffering. 
That's why 2 Timothy 3.12 says what it does. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, his credentials as a Jew. Forget all that stuff. It means absolutely nothing now. My list of sufferings, that was his credentials in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Forgetting all that. Things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press. How many people in here have done weightlifting? Okay, well, most of the guys, I'm sure. I press toward the mark. He's got a target he's shooting at of the prize of the high calling of God. God the Father, in Christ Jesus. That's available to everybody in this room that's in Christ. What you do with it is up to you. Okay? When he prays in Ephesians 6, where Perry was earlier, and pray for me that I might have boldness to preach Christ as I ought. That's hard to do. First time you do it, it's pretty scary. After a while, you might get decked. I think Richard got punched one time, if I remember the story right. Yeah, one time. <laughs> and it was for, for good. Anyway. Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended this one thing I do. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's got a prize he wants everybody to receive. And it's let me let me give you another verse. Keep your hand in Philippians and go to Colossians with, with me just for a moment. Colossians chapter 1 verse 25. Wherefore I, uh, 24. Who now rejoice in my what's it say? Sufferings for who? That's them. For you Colossians. They hadn't seen his face yet. It's interesting. We hadn't seen his face yet either, have we? Okay. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up with that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. So what is Paul doing? When he preached Christ, he's going to suffer what? Physical affliction that he can't do anything about except take it. And you know what comes out of that? As you get older, your body's going to deteriorate. <laughs> Trust me. The afflictions of Christ. <clears throat> are the afflictions of, of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to you, word, to fulfill the word of God. It was given to him to complete the word of God, not John. It's Paul. Fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. Are you ready? Among the Gentiles, which is Christ, where? And you, the hope of glory. My hope of glory is him. And that hope is in me. And as I look around, there's a lot of things that are kind of discouraging in the world going on. But you know, Satan's got to have his day. He has his day. We get our day. We get to live with him. And Paul in chapter 1 of Philippians, and I'm going to, well, I still got some more to do in chapter 3, and then I'm going to quit. Let's give him time to eat. Verse 15 of chapter 3 in Philippians. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now he said he hadn't reached it yet. As many be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained. Where you are in your understanding, your walk, and the, the walk by faith you have in that knowledge that you've got that Paul prayed for. Let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as we have 
you, ye have us as an example. For many walk, of whom I told you often, but now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind what? What did Paul say? To set your affection? The things you really adore and you care about? They're in the heavens. Okay? Above. Now, you got to come back down to earth because you still got to cut the grass. you got to cut down trees. you got to do whatever your vocation is to provide for those you care mm -hmm. for. Whether you like the vocation or not, you still got to do it. <laughs> for our conversation is our life is in heaven. I wanted to do 2 Corinthians 5, but I'm not going to do it today. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue, what's the next two words? All things. All things unto himself. Didn't we read that earlier with Perry and last night with Richard? What are the all things in the next book of Colossians? Thrones. Dominions, principalities, and powers. Every name that is named. I think there's one other one too. There might be two. Both which are seen and which are unseen. Both in heaven and on earth. That's the all things. He's going to subdue every bit of that on our behalf and we're going to benefit from it. Now, I don't know where we're going to be in the battle when all that's going on. You know what happens when you have a renter that you have to evict? You might go in and find out all your copper's gone <laughs> and anything else of any value you might find out. I suspect when they get kicked out of heaven there's, there's going to be some things to fix. But that's just me. That's my speculation. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything you've done in your Son for us. We look forward to the opportunity to see you one day, as Paul did in Philippians 1. I'm going to straight betwixt two, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain is more needful. Use us for your honor and your glory, for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Yeah, I am. All right. Well, we're over halfway done. It, it's amazing. It started last night, and there's been four. Well, we got uh, four more to go, so we're right in the middle, halfway. I've enjoyed all of it. So I'm looking forward to the tonight. Brother David, I'm looking forward to hearing Brother David and uh, Richard. And then in the morning, Brother Des Stridham was supposed to be here from Florida. Johnny Pierce, he had a funeral today, but he's going to fill in for Des in the morning, and then Brother Richard's going to close everything out. So we got dinner in the fussy bill, and he, I walked up there a while ago. He's got the last batch of chicken on now, and it was smelling good, looking good. But he said it should come off the grill at 12. So he's already got chicken and barbecue in the fellowship building. It's ready. So all you got to do is go out there and enjoy. So what we're going to do, we're going to pray here. And then you can just go pig out out there. All right? Have a good time. All right. Chicken out. All right, let's have a word prayer. Father, we thank you for what we've enjoyed already. We pray, Lord, this food would be a nourishment to our bodies. I pray, Lord, that we might use that nourishment, that we might be about your business. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs>